Hey everybody, welcome back to the Rare Degree Table. Today we are continuing our Dungeon Master preparation. No players, just Dungeon Masters. Our preparation of this starter set, The Lost Minds of Phandelver. And here we are at the end. We've made it. We've rescued Gundren Rockseeker, maybe. The dwarf who started us on this adventure weeks, maybe months ago. And he has helped us to find the legendary Wave Echo Cave, hoping to tap its wealth and magic while rescuing his brothers from the evil black spider who wants to keep this place for himself. Now, I would be doing a big recap at the table here as we start this final chapter, maybe laying out the important bullet points as a dungeon master and asking each player to give their favorite moment so far, their little highlight reel, because we want the players to remember the story here because it has been stretched out over several sessions at least, and they probably don't think about this outside of the game as much as we dungeon masters might keep that in mind that's easy to forget. Gundren is an excellent resource for doing this in character as much as he's you know nearly dead and very worried about his brothers he is also excited to find the forge of spells and get rich. I would have him ask the NPCs that are the player characters what they would do with all of this wealth that they're all soon going to be sharing. Even if they don't have answers right now, this questioning is going to get the player's wheels turning, especially if we do it at the close of a session. If we took a shortcut, right, or Gundren didn't make it, it is still good to do a big recap here and get the players psyched up for this final push. If Gundren fell somewhere along the way, we may need another way to get the party to Wave Echo Cave now to avenge their friend and, you know, get rich and do hero stuff. So we can put the map in play again. You know, I, I think it does confuse the story a little bit, but it's definitely the easiest way for the PCs to learn the location here. So maybe Gundren had an extra copy stashed away in a secret compartment in his boot or something. Right off, the druid can also tell us. Maybe he shows up and asks the party to please stop the black spider from harnessing the power of the spell forge. They can petition Agatha because she's been around forever. She was here when this place was rocking and rolling, so she knows. And maybe Human Coast could also tell them. One of the other Rock Seeker brothers could also show up in Phandalin to bring the party along to Wave Echo Cave, but turns out it's actually a doppelganger sent by the Black Spider because he's having trouble getting to the Forge of Spells, and that actually sounds pretty freaking awesome and, and would do a lot of work for us. So I might even consider doing that if Gundren is still alive and in the mix because it, it solves a couple problems I have with the final chapter of this adventure because it does. It, it has some problems for me. In this series, I have kept things very close to the book. Yes, I recommended that you consider cutting out Thunder Tree and I've given you a few other examples of like ways you could alter this adventure if you want to. But I do think that Lost Mine of Phandelver is pretty fantastic as it is. And I do encourage you to make it your own. And I'm considering making a bonus video about some potential ways to further alter things up. But if, if I thought that this adventure was fundamentally broken in some way, in need of sweeping changes, I wouldn't be recommending it to new Dungeon Masters or for, for anyone, really. That being said, I do think that the weakest part of this adventure book is the final push here. And that's okay, because we can fix any problems with a little creativity. Plus, there is definitely some really awesome stuff going on in this final dungeon. But the biggest problem I have with Wave Echo Cave, and therefore the Lost Mine of Phandelver, is that as a final boss, the Black Spider is a little lackluster. We've put in a bit of extra work to get him in the minds of the players earlier and more often than the book may tell us to, and maybe we'll talk about more ways to do that in the bonus thing, but at level four, Neznar is probably going to feel a little anticlimactic. I think there are two things going on here. One, the adventure kind of assumes that the player characters are not reaching this final battle with him at full strength, right? Obviously, this fight will feel different if the PCs limp in here barely running on fumes compared to if they just took a long rest and have all of their hit points and all of their spell slots and all of their resources. Two, in a way, the Black Spider is not actually the final boss here. 
as he has been thwarted by the guardians of the Forge of Spells. That's kind of a cool twist, honestly, the reveal that there is an even bigger big bad, but we need to make sure that that hits right. So we're going to take a two-pronged approach to making this ending more satisfying. We're going to be prepared to beef up the fight with the Black Spider, and we're going to telegraph that there are stronger foes down here in the Lost Mine. But let us start at the beginning. Room 1. We get a dead Rockseeker brother and a little story revealed. The other brother is conspicuously not here raising the question, where is he? If Gundren has joined the party up to this point, this is a great opportunity to get rid of him because we kind of don't want to drag him through this dungeon. Um, so Gundren, he wants to take his brother's body back to Phandalin, back to town for funeral rites while encouraging the party to go ahead to find his other brother and to stop the Black Spider from claiming the Forge of Spells. Quick note, there are these sweet magic boots here but I would have them off to the side, not literally on our dead NPC's feet, especially if Gundren is here. We're not likely to feel good looting Thardin's corpse. Now, the whole time we're exploring here, the eponymous waves of Wave Echo Cave are sounding, giving us a nice little detail, some like atmosphere for this final chapter of our adventure. But it is also doing a few other things as well. It is making it hard to hear anything else so it's giving us disadvantage on a lot of perception checks. And it is pulling the characters towards room 16 if we let it or if we want it to. Now, I think of it more as a geyser than like ocean waves because that just makes more sense to me in this kind of environment. Um, so it's occurring once in a while, not all of the time. And that lets us also use it kind of as a timer element if we want to ratchet up the tension here, maybe even rolling for those wandering monster encounters when we describe the crashing sounds echoing through the dark abandoned corridors of this place. Now this place is the biggest one that we've run so far, but I think it's gonna be easier on you to keep track of what's going on where by seeing it as divided into three pieces. The top left corner is where the Black Spider has control, the whole right side is the Forge of Spells, and that kind of leaves the rest, the front half of this dungeon, rooms 2 through 10, and they are telling the story of what happened here centuries ago. We can see the aftermath of the huge battle between the orcs, the invaders, and the dwarves, the gnomes, and humans who banded together here to form Fandelver's Pack. If your players enjoy the exposition, I might have like a hasty journal entry in maybe room five spelling all this stuff out. Maybe mentioning how the final surviving mage Mormusk summoned a guardian to protect the spell forged and used necromancy in a desperate final defense of this place. On top of the history playing out with the centuries old dead borks and dwarves, I would incorporate a fresher layer here as well of defeated ghouls and bugbears, showing that they've been fighting it out here. We want the players to learn that the black spider is struggling, is stuck, and you know, he might not get a chance to explain things before the PCs simply attack him. Don't just count on your big bad getting the opportunity to monologue. Always have multiple ways to get information to your players. Another helpful change to consider here in these early rooms is maybe having more Musk the Rask actually appear to raise these undead in rooms four and six and nine. It's always good to put the big bad in front of the players before that final confrontation with them. And this way, Mormusk has an opportunity probably to drop some knowledge. He'd likely believe that these player characters are actually with the Black Spider at first, but if he learns that they're actually hunting this drow, Mormusk may actually point the way to the temple where Neznar has made his base. If we can get the idea across that the Black Spider and the denizens of the mine are actually in conflict and that the Black Spider is losing, I think we make this dungeon more interesting for sure, and we take some pressure off of Neznar to be the biggest, baddest boss we encounter here. It could take a few sessions to get through Wave Echo Cave, depending on how your table plays, how long a session is, but we can streamline things here a bit as well if we want to. If you want to edit out a lot of these early fights and kind of speed things up, that's okay. Maybe we just have the Sturges if the players haven't seen them before because they're different and the Ochre Jelly because they, it's different and it's cool. And then like one single battle royale with the undead probably in room nine, right? 
as waves of skeletons and then ghouls rise up and enter from different areas, you know, coming in waves, as Mormusk also pops in and out, talking to the player characters at the top of each round, maybe. Now, the Black Spider's forces are all up in that northwest corner of the complex here. We've got Bugbears in 11 and 18, and Neznar himself in 19. We've also got the Doppelganger walking around as Nundro, who's got a ton of potential for roleplay and betrayal. And if he survived, I would also put Glass Staff in the mix here as well, if he's, you know, alive and on the loose. As we reach room 19, I like to have the player characters overhear Glass Staff or the Doppelganger announcing their arrival, saying the Black Spider's name out loud, right, conveniently, and talking about how the holy water they've just secured might be the key to reaching the Spellforge. This gives the players the tool to keep that flame skull down and maybe the knowledge to use it. It also telegraphs that things might be tough on the other side of this place. On that note, also, I think rather than just try to kill them, I believe Team Neznar would much prefer to send the PCs into 12 through 15 over there to fight for them, because either way it could turn their two problems into one problem. Depending on how your party is built and what they've done, what they've gone through to get to this point, you know, this battle may feel like a fitting conclusion to the campaign, in which case... Awesome, great. Especially with Glass Staff and the Doppelganger replacing a couple of these giant spiders, it, it might work just perfectly for you. One cool boss fight move, watch your players respond as Neznar downs a healing potion. He can still have one to loot after it's over, but that's a great way to keep him alive for an extra round or two, and I bet the players have a visceral response. If you can manage, keep track of your PC's hit points too. And don't be afraid to just, you know, flat out ask each player what they are working with, maybe right before we enter 19. If they easily finish this fight, have good HP still, and it doesn't really feel satisfying, I would have Lolf, the evil spider goddess of the drow, and you don't have to explain that, but that's, that's canon, the goddess of the drow can do this. Have her show up and resurrect the black spider as a drider. We're going to show the image of the drider and just keep on with Neznar's original stats. I'd bet that this is way more what the players had in mind anyway when they've been imagining the black spider. Maybe have him shoot fairy fire, right, and a web as lair actions after he's resurrected. Then have him just doing two attacks per round with his spider staff. This two-phase boss fight thing is a popular trope for a reason. It's a little cliche, but it works, and it is likely enough on its own to make a mediocre battle into a more memorable one. Crank up his HP to the max if he's going to drop in that, like, first round back, and if the player characters are beasts, maybe you gave them way too many magic items or something, then yeah, maybe even throw the real Drider at them, but AC-19 is a little tough. Okay, I am not telling you to use it, but there is one more tactical nuke in this room. If this fight is all but over and the player characters, the PCs, are doing just fine, we have an official answer by the book of exactly how much damage is caused if the ceiling in here comes down, if it collapses. This occurs by the book if someone tries to pry the jewels out of the dwarven statue's eyes, but to me, it feels like a final desperate magic missile spell that hits enough of these cracked marble columns could do it as well. That might even make more sense to me. Be careful with this one as we're looking at 24 damage on average on every character that fails the save. But know it's there if this is the final battle and it's proven to be a cakewalk. Because, yeah, this would certainly provide a memorable ending. The real Nundro is stashed away in room 20, and he is maybe the last chance for you to influence the party's next steps. You don't want to tell them what to do, but you can certainly send some signs along the way. They might want to, you know, pack it up back to town, call the campaign complete, and that's... That's fine, especially if they've already dealt with, like, the eastern side of Wave Echo Cave. That might be it, you know, the, the time for an epilogue or the next phase of the campaign to come on knocking. But if we haven't reached the Spell Forge yet, and it feels right, I would have Nundro talk up taking a long rest and then making a final push to claim the splendors of Wave Echo Cave for ourselves. Again, don't force anything, just suggest it. 
It is the player's choice. We don't want to railroad anybody, and we don't know the order of events, how they're going to make their way through this place. There are many different paths you can trace through Wave Echo Cave, and we've got the sound of the booming water that's pulling the players towards that northeast corner. We've got Neznar, who might point the way to the Forge of Spells if the party talks to him before they fight it out. And we've got Mormusk maybe pointing the party towards Neznar. But for me, it feels like the trio of the Flame Skull, the Spectator, and Mormusk the Wrath make for a much better series of final battles than just the Black Spider, even when we jazz him up. Especially if we learn these three monsters' abilities and play them to the hilt. Now these three encounters are built in a way so that the party can run without the baddies really given chase, right? But if the players do this, if they take the time to replenish their resources, take a rest, in my mind, that gives the monsters time to replenish theirs as well and maybe do a little more preparation. The Flame Skull drops a fireball and as much of the party as it can right away. Round two, Flaming Sphere. Round three, bonus action to move the sphere around as it fires two rays out of its empty eye sockets. Alternatively, you could use that concentration on Blur to make it harder to hit, but keep in mind it can fly in and out of reach and has shield as a reaction. This thing is awesome and scary and is probably going to light back up in an hour, so the party might be facing it again. Plus, it just looks cool. Now, the Flame Skull actually does speak common, sure, but I think it's the spectator that's going to be a little more conversational. And it's smart enough to assess the party during their little chat. It can judge which characters probably have higher wisdom saving throws versus constitution saving throws, and it will know that for when it's flying around shooting two different eye beams per round later. This may actually be the final beat of the adventure, and we've reached the Forge of Spells, so have fun role-playing this mildly insane aberration. If and when battle begins, do what you can to get cinematic with it, narrating actions in the flickering, eerie gree light of the, you know, failing spell forge, and the echoing, booming sounds of the waves of Wave Echo Cave. Also, as always, don't be afraid to just whoop, slide this thing's HP up to the maximum to buy another round or two of combat if that feels right. Now, the Wrath Mormusk is likely doing the most exposition of these three, and he is willing to negotiate. As written, he'll pay the party to take out the Spectator, and I would add the Black Spider to that list as well. There is a chance that's actually already completed by the time we reach this room, by the time we meet him. So maybe this negotiation is a lot easier than the book portrays. If we do have a fight here, life drain is no joke. Max HP dropping to zero equals no death saving throws, just instant death. Add in his host of damage resistances and that incorporeal movement that lets him slide through the walls to just wait for his next turn, and it makes him pretty tough as well. This treasure map in this room is a great way to point the player characters to whatever is next. And as always, a room full of books is also a beautiful opportunity to impart some knowledge or reveal some secrets to the party. Maybe somebody's family name is actually on one of these tomes, and it turns out that they are the rightful heir to Tresendar Manor or Cragmaw Castle. Maybe we get a book on what the Ordening, right? And a treasure map to the to the buried MacGuffin in nearby Tribor if we're heading into Storm King's Thunder. This is your world, and the possibilities are endless. However we get through this adventure, it may be the case that not everyone who walked into Wave Echo Cave gets to walk back out, and that is okay. Death is a big part of D&D, and it is a very impactful element in storytelling. It's going to make things poignant and memorable, and if it happens, give it the space and the gravity it deserves, and let it be. However things play out, in whatever sequence they may happen, this will be the culmination of weeks or maybe even months of collective gameplay and collaborative storytelling. So I would give each of your players an opportunity to describe what their character does afterwards. Maybe in the downtime after this chapter, the story closes before the next one begins. It's probably best if they have time to think about their answers instead of just putting them on the spot. For starters, there's wealth coming to them, right, from their share of Wave Echo Cave, most likely. So maybe we're using it to build a stronghold 
where maybe there's a memorial to be built for fallen PCs or NPCs. We can even talk about what we want for our next campaign as part of this process, whether we start a new story at level one or continue this one, taking these characters and or, you know, maybe some new ones to move forward now at level five. Maybe we want to explore some of our PCs' backstories, do a little homebrewing as a DM, or tie up some loose ends of this story first. In the next video, I'm going to talk about a couple options you might take to move forward after Wave Echo Cave and the Lost Mine of Fandelver have concluded, as well as some changes you could make to this adventure and advice from some other voices out there on running this incredible story. Thank you so much for watching. If you found these videos helpful, hitting like and subscribe down below is a great way to let me know that. Have fun, be kind, and I will see you next time. Thanks.